All right, thank you for your patience. We uh, are very grateful. Welcome to the Foreign Press Center. Uh, we're here for a preview of the visit of President Xi Jinping of China. We have with us uh, Matt Pottinger, who is the Senior Director for Asia at the National Security Council. On his right is uh, Susan Thornton, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs at the State Department. They'll each offer opening statements as usual. As usual, I'll moderate a question and answer session. Uh, we have a limited amount of time today. We'd appreciate your keeping your questions to one part uh, to allow your colleagues to continue to, to have opportunities. Uh, uh, as, as you ask a question, please identify yourselves and your outlets. Uh, we'll go to our colleagues in New York as appropriate. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome, Mr. Pottinger. Hey, thank you very much. It's, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Matt Pottinger uh, at uh, the Senior Director for Asia, as my colleague mentioned. Uh, we are going to kick off uh, the first summit uh, between uh, the President of China, Xi Jinping, and uh, President Trump tomorrow uh, down in Mar-a-Lago. Uh, this will be uh, the first time that the two have met and really an opportunity for the two leaders to uh, get to know one another, uh, to talk about bilateral issues uh, and regional issues, uh, and uh, starting with areas of cooperation but also many uh, areas of difference in the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, it's going to kick off tomorrow afternoon. Uh, both leaders will fly into, uh, into Palm Beach and uh, have a relaxed interaction uh, starting late tomorrow afternoon. Uh, both sides' spouses will be there. They'll have uh, an opportunity to uh, have tea together, uh, uh, meet some of their senior uh, cabinet officials, so to speak, uh, on both sides, uh, and have a dinner. The following day on Friday, uh, there will be a series of meetings uh, that will uh, go up to and in include a working lunch. And uh, those meetings will have a variety of formats. Uh, the, the presidents will have uh, some of their uh, respective senior uh, officials with them uh, to cover a lot of ground. Uh, we'll uh, be talking about, uh, of course, uh, North Korea. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, trade and the economic relationship. We'll be talking about um, uh, maritime issues uh, and, and a variety of other uh, areas of, uh, of cooperation uh, and, uh, and areas where we want to cooperate more closely with China. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone, or I guess it's afternoon already. Um, just before we start, I did want to pay homage to a great Washington, D.C. tradition going on right now, which is the Cherry Blossom Festival. So on my way over here today, I noticed all of the trees are out and in bloom, and I hope you'll all get a chance, maybe when you leave here, to go over to the Tidal Basin and see uh, the most miraculous kind of beautiful uh, unveiling of all of the cherry blossoms over there. Of course, um, a gift given to us by the government of Japan back a number of decades ago. So hope you all won't miss that for all of your focus on this upcoming summit. Um, of course, as Matt mentioned, we'll have the two leaders uh, coming together tomorrow in uh, Florida at Mar-a-Lago. And there's been some discussion about the venue. And I just wanted to note that this is a chance for, as he said, the two leaders to get to know one another. We want to have them establish a good working relationship so that they can, in times of both opportunity and crisis, reach out to one another and have a good uh, rapport. And so I think having the summit down in Florida um, is a good chance in a more informal atmosphere, more relaxed for them to have these discussions. That will be very serious, of course, very important discussions, trying to kick off a good relationship um, at the outset of this administration and look for what our priority issues are that we're going to work on, how we're going to address challenges, and how we're going to um, also talk about some of the areas that the Trump administration and President himself has focused on, like trade uh, problems and, and challenges in the trading relationship and the investment relationship and also North Korea, as Matt mentioned. So I think uh, we'll be looking to make it a very constructive and results-based kind of a meeting. Uh, you know, we're looking to sort of level the playing field on trade, talk about global challenges, how we can work together. 
um, but basically, you know, how we can bring home results for the American people out of the U.S.-China relationship. So I think uh, with that, um, Mark will help us to moderate questions. Thanks very much. Please identify yourselves and your outlet. Please keep your questions to one part so we have uh, opportunities. Let's do a Carter in the middle, please, in the white shirt. Uh, thank you. My name is Carter Ice. I'm with the Asahi Shimbun. Um, just very quickly, I wanted to know which State Department officials were planning on going on the trip, and if you had more insight into why Mar-a-Lago was chosen versus the White House for the venue. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as for the, the exact, uh, you know, manifests of planes heading down to Mar-a-Lago, I don't have a lot of detail, but I'll be going. Uh, Secretary of State will be going. I'm assuming his chief of staff will be going, his policy advisor will be going, and there are a number of other State Department officials, of course, down there on the ground right now. We have our entire protocol team down there, our security teams are down there, and a number of other, of course, uh, officials will be going down. Um, on the reason for the venue choice, I spoke about it a little bit already, and maybe Matt can amplify, but I would just point to sort of the importance of informal kinds of uh, meetings and uh, non-traditional venues and the role that those have played in the history of U.S.-China relations over time. Um, a lot of our sort of relationship building has always been done at off-site type of venues. And I think, um, you know, we always want to have high-level engagement in the U.S.-China relationship. It's a very important relationship, and it's really broad and wide-ranging, and so we want to be able to establish that kind of good relationship. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's go to Jennifer in the green, Jennifer Chen with Shenzhen Media Group China. We know during the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson's Beijing visit, he commented, which is most of the past for Xi Trump meeting, he uh, commented twice about the, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, basing U.S.-China relations on non-conflict, non-confrontation, um, uh, mutual respect, women cooperation, uh, receiving great feedback in China, uh, where President Trump uh, agree to the same principles or expression in a meeting with President Xi. And yesterday, a senior uh, White House official said, uh, U.S. and China have good opportunities in North Korea issues. What was he referring to? Thank you very much. Oh, closer. Is that good? Okay. Um, so you talked about the Secretary's trip to China, and I think uh, there's been a lot of media focus on his expressions that he used in his uh, press statement there. What I would say about that, and I was there, um, is that the secretary was using his statement during the press avail in Beijing to refer to the key elements that have characterized U.S.-China relations going back 40 years since the original Nixon visit to China. And what he was talking about in that, in that uh, press avail, and if you look at the transcript, I think you'll see this pretty clearly, um, he was talking about the two leaders coming together at this summit coming up the next couple of days to set a new course for U.S.-China relations for the next 40 to 50 years. So the elements that he raised in his, um, his recitation of those formulations you mentioned were really talking about how we've managed the relationship going back. And now um, he thinks it's important for the two leaders to come together and discuss how they're going to set a cho uh, course for the future. So I would, I would characterize it that way. And I was going to answer the question on North Korea that in terms of an area of cooperation, of course, we would like to see China working closely with the United States uh, to address the menace uh, emanating from North Korea. Their, their weapons programs, uh, the provocations that we're seeing uh, every week, uh, uh, missile launches, including one that we just had uh, not too many hours ago. There's an opportunity for that to be an, an area uh, uh, of cooperation and to, and to grow that. I think it's in Beijing's interest. I think that North Korea... Uh, long ago ceased to be a strategic asset 
for China. It is now quite clearly a strategic liability. And it is one that is having an impact uh, on the region. It is one that has the, uh, the potential to destabilize not only the peninsula, uh, but, but really the, the region as a whole. Thank you very much. Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Regarding one China and one China policy and Taiwan issue, uh, Matt, yesterday you mentioned that uh, you don't anticipate that uh, President Trump will have any surprising deviation from the uh, long standing US one China policy. But I'm still curious if the Chinese side raised this issue and saying that, hey, uh, you need me uh, to cooperate on North Korea. It's very urgent, but I would like you to abide by one China principle, uh, uh, abide by the three communicates, uh, particularly the third communicate, reducing the arms sales to Taiwan. So what would you expect that Donald Trump will respond? Thank you. Well, we'll see what comes up in the conversation between the two leaders. Uh, I don't want to um, pre prejudge uh, or, um, what, what topics will come up, but as you mentioned, President Trump did reaffirm uh, back in February longstanding U.S. policy. That's uh, our one China policy, which is consistent with uh, the three communiques. It's consistent with our obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, I can say that there's no such thing as uh, as some kind of a trade along the lines of what you uh, just mentioned, though. Okay. Hi, it's uh, John Keogh from the Australian Financial Review. Uh, Matt, you being an ex-business journalist will probably appreciate this question as much as anyone. Um, financial markets investors very interested um, with the outlook between US and China on the trade relationship with the talk of potential trade wars and, and tariffs, although that seems to have receded a bit lately. Um, what can people expect for the outcomes on trade? Will, will there be hard outcomes or is this a more, um, they'll define a framework? And, and similarly for allies in the Asian region um, who are a little bit nervous about a potential trade war down the track, what message would you send to them? So I, I think uh, it, it is fair to, to say that, uh, that trade uh, and, and the economic relationship generally uh, will be a uh, significant topic of discussion between the, the presidents at the summit. Um, the question of hard outcomes, um, again, the spirit of this summit is for the two to develop a relationship, to really establish a relationship, and to lay out the key concerns that each side has uh, about the relationship and, uh, uh, and to then begin moving towards some kind of a formal um, uh, series of dialogues uh, that, that will aim to address those issues as well as areas of, of uh, longstanding cooperation between the two sides. Um, the, uh, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Okay, um, yeah, I'm Kim Sok Chang from Christian Broadcasting System uh, from Korea. And my question is actually, yeah, as you mentioned, we need a time for the spare time, uh, spare time for the cherry blossom, you know. And so uh, would you possibly can give us that will there be a, a press conference uh, after the meeting? And would you give us a, a little more detailed schedule about that? Uh, also, um, if possible, uh, would you possibly can give us uh, what does that mean uh, when you're saying that the clock has running, uh, the clock has running out? So um, yeah, so if you possible, just uh, give us a little more uh, explanation about that. Well, thank you very much. Do you want to talk about the schedule a bit? Well, I don't. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that. Um, well, I'm not the person to talk about the schedule, but I think that the question came up yesterday about the press arrangements at the Mar-a-Lago summit, and I think probably the best thing to do there, probably neither one of us is the best person to 
talk in detail about that. So um, if there needs some further detail on the press arrangements surrounding the summit, um, probably the White House press office would be the place to get those details. Um, I mean, I was just going to say on the issue that you talked about with regard to North Korea, I think you heard Secretary of State Tillerson, he was in Korea not long ago, made a trip to the demilitarized zone, uh, had a press conference in Korea and spoke pretty clearly on the issue of where we stand on uh, North Korea right now. Uh, that he said that, you know, the time for talking is uh, now over, strategic patience has run out. This problem has really become very urgent, and it is, as Matt said, destabilizing uh, to the entire region, and actually further than the region now, reaches across the globe with the pro progress that North Korea is making in, uh, you know, developing an intercontinental ballistic missile. So I think uh, the feeling on our side is that this problem has really now become urgent, and we are going to be not only talking to the Chinese this week, but I think you saw on Monday Ambassador to the UN Nikki Haley announced that we're going to be convening a ministerial meeting at which the Secretary of State is going to preside up in New York later this month to uh, talk and galvanize a lot more support from our other partners and allies around around the world on this issue and chart a way forward in a very urgent way because we feel that you know this uh, problem has now uh, crossed a certain uh, line and we can no longer uh, hope for you know some kind of reversion to negotiations we need to do something proactive to uh, you know change the situation and get some results and we hope that the Chinese are going to be involved in that. Uh, we'll certainly be talking to them about that in the next couple of days. We think they have a lot to contribute, um, and so we'll see where we get on that. Now, um, I know you've been serving on this position for years, and can you tell us a little bit different of how you, how do you tell the difference between helping the two administration preparing the meeting with the two leader? And Matt, we all remember there was a logistical flap last year when President Obama arrived in China, and Trump, the candidate Trump at that time, uh, tweeted out that it's a sign of disrespect, and he would have left. So when preparing for this trip, the first meeting of the two presidents, how do you um, try to avoid all these surprise might infuriate the president to leave? Sure. So I, I should start by saying that, that President Trump is a extremely gracious host. Um, he is going to um, uh, certainly seek to um, uh, extend uh, complete hospitality uh, to to his guests, uh, Xi Jinping and Madame Peng. Um, I uh, uh, know that there is a, a lot of work going on to ensure that the uh, uh, the safety and, and dignity of, uh, of both leaders is well protected uh, during the course of the visit. Yeah, and maybe just on preparations for summits in general, um, you know, it's very hard to, to compare one visit with another visit, never, never mind across uh, different administrations, because every visit is actually different, it's special, and it comes at a different time in the relationship. So I think um, this visit is special because it's not in Washington, D.C., it's a more informal meeting. And, you know, with that comes a lot of preparatory work that's being done down off-site in Florida by our, like I said, our protocol teams have been down there for days working together, the Chinese protocol team and the State Department's protocol team along with White House staff. Uh, we've got our security teams down there working with the local police in Florida. So I think that, 
you know, when it happens in Washington, a lot of these things are uh, all set up already and everybody knows the ropes. But, you know, when you're doing it at a new location, sometimes there are new people that have to be brought into the fold. And I think that's what we're focused on, making sure that all the local uh, officials know what their roles are and how they can be helpful and, you know, that everyone knows sort of um, what the program is and the president's expectations for a very successful summit. And I'm sure that our teams down there are going to meet that. So uh, let's take our colleague in New York, please. Yeah. Hi, this is Manik Mehta, syndicated journalist on North Korea. President Trump recently said that uh, the U.S. will go alone against North Korea if China does not cooperate. And uh, Secretary Tillerson issued a very small statement today saying that the time for talk was over and we need action. Could you amplify that? And what exactly does action mean? I think, I mean, we we have both answered this question over the last couple of days, but I'll just, um, you know, reiterate again. I think on Secretary Tillerson's trip to Northeast Asia, um, you saw uh, him in his expressions about North Korea and where we are in our uh, policy review clearly express the, uh, that patience has, has basically come to an end we are looking for an action-focused, results-oriented approach, and we are going to be uh, trying to cooperate with other partners and allies in a global coalition, really, to try to solve this problem in an urgent way um, that we haven't really uh, taken up before. So I think that's the sense that you're getting from Secretary Tillerson's uh, statement today, his statement last night following the latest um, provocation out of North Korea, the illegal missile launch. And I think also, um, you know, the sense that, you know, we are really um, going to defend our allies and our interests in the region, uh, our commitment to the defense of South Korea and Japan is ironclad, and that we um, will do whatever is necessary to ensure that we're going to maintain security in that region and that we're going to be very serious about pursuing a solution to the illegal North Korean weapons programs. Time for our last question here in the. Thank you, Mariko Freitas from Kyoto News. I wanted to ask about secondary sanctions. Would you be able to tell us whether the president or the secretary of state will be discussing this issue at the summit? And um, if that's the case, what do you expect the outcome to be? And how ready are you to implement secondary sanctions? Thank you. Sure. So um, I'm not going to go into the specifics of, uh, of our approach on, on North Korea, but I will say that this is going to be a, um, uh, uh, an early topic of conversation during the summit. And... Uh, uh, I, we, we w will not uh, sort of broadcast uh, talking points of the president in advance, but of course the question of sanctions generally uh, is, uh, is very much uh, a live one. It's an operative issue because the uh, situation is really boiled down to um, uh, one of having to apply more pressure and economic pressure is uh, uh, something that China has the ability to bring to bear in a way uh, that no other single country uh, can. So uh, for that, thanks. Okay, I think that uh, concludes our briefing. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your patience with the uh, adjustment.